Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. In our last lesson, we began a new series studying the subject of revival. That first podcast was all about defining what revival is not and what it is. There's no way to give an accurate definition of what revival is until we first make it clear what revival isn't. This is a very effective way of helping us to understand a particular Bible truth, looking at both what it is and what it is not. In this lesson, we are going to study 2 Chronicles 7.14, which is probably the most often used verse to teach on the subject of revival. The context of a verse is always important which means that the setting of this covenant promise that was given to King Solomon is integral to correctly understanding what the Lord is promising. The Lord visited King Solomon at night in a dream sometime after the dedication of the temple, and we see this in verses 11 and 12 in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. The Lord began talking to Solomon by stating, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. This is directly in reference to the prayer King Solomon offered during the dedication of the temple. The Lord was giving the Israelites a privilege that was unheard of in the history of mankind. Though the temple was similar to what the Lord did in giving the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the tabernacle in the wilderness, there was something more to this. Here was the tremendous privilege of the Lord drawing near to the people of Israel in an unprecedented way. With this privilege came a great responsibility— The Lord was entering into a covenant with the people, which bound the Lord and His people together. Covenant between God and man is more radical than we understand. If the people would be faithful to God, then the Lord would be faithful to them. Obedience to the Lord would bring great blessings. Rebellion would bring horrible discipline and even divine judgment if they totally backslid. This covenant promise of Israel is directly tied into His promise of severe discipline when the people forsake the Lord. And we see this in verse 13. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people. There's only one reason why the Lord would do this. Because the people had entered into covenant with God. Yet within the promise of severe discipline for their backsliding was a promise of restoration or revival. But there were serious conditions that were linked to receiving this expression of divine mercy. Now, we have to understand with this, we cannot earn mercy. So this wasn't something that could earn mercy, but it is the means by which we can obtain mercy from God. The covenant promise of revival was given to Israel as a people that were in covenant with him. So how does this covenant promise work for those who aren't under the covenant that was given to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? In other words, to the people of Israel. Those who are followers of Jesus are in covenant with him. And this would mean that certain other covenants would apply to them as well. The covenant that comes through becoming a follower of Messiah doesn't supersede the covenants the Lord gave the Jews. For I thoroughly reject replacement theology, where the church supposedly replaces the Jewish people. The promises that the Lord gave the Jews still stands. But salvation comes through Jesus Christ alone. And this goes for the Jews as well. The conditions of the covenant promise of revival are true. And they work for Jews and Gentiles alike. And now that the Messiah has come to mankind, the salvation that comes through that covenant will lead people to Jesus, the promised Messiah. The principles of the covenant of 2 Chronicles 7.14 is clear and powerful, and it still works today. So let me read to you the verse. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So let's just take this apart systematically here. The Lord begins by saying, if my people. So, like I said earlier, this was originally meant for the Jews. But now it belongs to all those who are in covenant with Messiah Jesus. The benefits of this covenant are extended to God's people as they fulfill the conditions and then flows to both backsliders and those who have never known Christ as Lord and Savior. Yet everyone who will do what this verse teaches will come to true salvation. So this promise works for God's people, for the Jews, for backsliders, and non-believers. This is how it begins. 
that they must humble themselves. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 states, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Both Peter and James taught the truth that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Then Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, being poor in spirit is more than just humility. It incorporates brokenness. And brokenness is where we come to the end of our self-sufficiency, of our self-life, of our self-trust, where we are poor in the sense that we no longer have anything of value to trust in of ourselves. And so we must look to one who is greater and more powerful, one who is able to truly meet our needs. And of course, that's God. Correct understanding of who we are and of who God is, is integral to becoming poor in spirit. Pride is the exact opposite of being poor in spirit. It is the trust of self, reliance upon self. It's thinking that we can do what is necessary to be good enough or right enough with God to make heaven our home. With this being poor in spirit comes a deep consciousness of our overwhelming neediness. And that is so important. This isn't some beat down negative idea about who we are as people. This is coming to the reality that we are creatures that were created to be dependent upon God. We have been in rebellion against him. And so now we realize that rebellion and we are now coming to the place of submission, of surrender to him. And we begin to find the blessings of what it is to be poor in spirit. Being poor in spirit is not the idea that we are somehow just worthless or good for nothing. God has put such value on us that we were first created in his image, and then he died upon the cross after becoming human, which elevated mankind's value even more. So here's this God that has put such tremendous value upon us, but we have rebelled against him. And before we can see God bring revival to us personally and then to the church, there must be this humility that comes into our lives where we are seeing our neediness. The thing that comes out of being poor in spirit is the very next beatitude, which is Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn. What does it mean to mourn? Is it just having some melancholy, bad attitude about ourselves and life and walking around with our heads slumped down in depression? No, it has nothing to do with a depressed mentality or some beat down mentality. This is all about repentance, mourning over our sin. Not a depressed attitude. Depression comes out of self-absorption. Repentance comes out of a knowledge that we are sinners in desperate need of a Savior and we're seeing the truth and reality of our sin because humility starts opening up our eyes to the depth of sin and this then in turn leads us to repentance. Repentance is the gift of God. It comes from God. It is not something from the devil. It's not from the world. It's not just cultural norms. It is the reality of God breaking into our lives, revealing to us the truth of what sin is, and that we then begin to respond to that through repentance, through crying out for God to forgive us and transform us. So this is comprehending the depth of spiritual poverty and the consequences of our sin nature. The third beatitude is, is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, blessed are the meek. What is meekness? There again, when we think of this from a worldly standpoint, we think of meekness as this weakness, but it has nothing to do with weakness. Meekness is all about coming under God's rule. It comes out of this whole progression that we start to humble ourselves before God because we're poor in spirit. We're being broken of our self-reliance and of our pride. And as a result of seeing the reality of our sin, we begin to take the path of mourning, the path of repentance over our sin. And as we begin to see that our sin has been expressions of lawlessness and rebellion, we then learn how to start coming under the rule of God. So meekness is all about coming under the rule of God, where we stop being rebels, we stop fighting against him, we stop thinking we know better than he does, and we start submitting to him, we start surrendering to him. So this meekness is coming under God's rule, and we could think of meekness also as this powerful work of surrender that we need to be living out in our lives. We will never do this until we humble ourselves and take the path of repentance. Now, meekness equals death to our rebellion, and it produces sweet submission to God. Now, when we are in a state of rebellion, we are only going to think of submission as a negative thing because we're rebels, and as rebels, we think our rebellion is a good thing, a noble thing even. 
But when we start coming under the rule of God, we start being convicted of our sin because we're starting to humble ourselves before him. We start seeing our rebellion as utterly, completely evil and that it has produced nothing but pain and suffering and misery in our life and it has not produced good. Rebellion never produces good, never brings hope or peace, never produces what we think that it's going to produce. Rebellion only takes us into greater rebellion, which produces greater sin and more pain and more misery and more sorrow as we move further and further away from God. Humility and brokenness are inseparable in bringing people to genuine repentance and absolute surrender to Christ. Now, integral to this whole process, we can say one thing leads into another, which leads into another, which in one sense is true. The brokenness, humility is going to lead us into the place of repentance is going to lead us into meekness, which is coming under God's rule. So that's true. But in the process of this all, none of this can happen unless we do this one thing that we are told to pray. So if my people who are called by my name will pray. Now, we have to understand what prayer is here. Prayer is not written down prayers. It's not about having some prayer book and reading them over. It's not about saying the Lord's Prayer over again and again. And to pray the rosary and the Hail Marys is absolute idolatry, so it has nothing to do with that. That is not prayer that's acceptable to God. So prayer is ultimately communication. It is communicating with God, and so we put the word prayer to it, but that's all it really is, is communication with God. And so when we start to pray and we start knowing what humility is and what repentance is and what meekness is, prayer starts taking on this whole type of presence that is so wonderful because now we come to God seeing our needs, unashamed to come to him in our needs and crying for God to meet our needs. So this idea of praying is beginning with praying for our personal needs. It is right for us to pray for our personal needs. Now, it's wrong for us to pray for our personal needs if that's all we pray about. We need to learn how to pray for our own needs. And so what do we pray for? Let's just look at the Beatitudes again. We pray for humility and brokenness in our life. We pray for meekness. God, teach me how to surrender. Teach me how to come under your rule. Lord, teach me how to have a heart of repentance, that I am quick to repent whenever you convict me, no matter what it is. But then we start praying for other things, like the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is God's will for every believer, that we start praying. We start saying, God, I see the truth of this in your word. Lord, I want the reality of it in my life. Lord, you promise that you give this to whosoever. I'm a whosoever. So God, give me the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And if you already have it, then you start using the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You start praying in that heavenly language to worship God, to pray, to intercede for the sake of others, and to do spiritual warfare. You also pray about personal holiness, because without holiness, no one will see God. So it is a very right thing to go and say, God, help me to be holy. And the things that you are not being holy in, that you cry out for grace to be holy, a desire to be holy, and a fight to be holy, a holy ambition in us to get the sin out of our life. And then it's right for us to pray for wholehearted love for God, to love him more than anyone, any person, anything. Now, this is a prayer that we need to pray till our dying day, because we're always having these things that are trying to rob our love, to take our heart and our mind away from Christ. So whenever we feel our heart wandering, we need to quickly go to Christ and ask him for the grace that we would love him supremely. And when we're loving him well, we need to ask him for the grace to continue loving him well, that we will make sure that we love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength until the day we die. Now, I think the reality is, is there's nobody that loves him with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength, because we're all frail, fallen people. So we can always learn how to love him a little bit more. Each and every day, a little bit more, we can grow in that love. And if we think that we have arrived, that we have loved him to the fullest extent of our human ability, then we will never go any further in that. But when we realize there can be this growth, this maturing in our life to love him more, then we can keep crying out for that. And I believe God will listen to that prayer of a cry to love him more. Then we need power to forgive other people who do hurt us. And guess what? You live in this world for long, you start realizing that you have to deal with the hurts that people have inflicted upon you. But you can never forget that you have inflicted hurt upon other people. Otherwise, you become self-righteous and angry at individuals because you think that you shouldn't be hurt, even though the same things you're angry at them over, you have done yourself. This is so serious that Jesus said, if we do not forgive people, we will not be forgiven. And that means those who refuse to forgive 
are still in their sin. And if they're still in their sin, this can move a person outside of salvation, which is a very scary thing. So we need power to forgive people because sometimes we have a very hard time doing that. But there's grace offered to us to be able to accomplish it. And then we need to cry out in prayer that God would give us a passion to win the lost and to disciple the saved. We need to love the church and we need to love a perishing world to want to see them come into the church and find true salvation. Ian Bounds made the statement, prayer is the only thing that does any good. The only thing that makes effective everything else that we do. He who is too busy to pray will be too busy to live a holy life. Now that's a powerful statement and it's true. The second expression of prayer is intercession. And this is something we need to learn how to do in our life. We have to get beyond always praying for ourselves. Like I said a moment ago, it's good and right for us to pray about our own personal needs. But we have to learn how to let selflessness get into our prayers where we start interceding for the sake of others, for the needs of others, that we look beyond our own struggles and problems to see that there are people that are suffering more than we are. And anybody that is not a true follower of Jesus, they are going to suffer forever and ever in hell if they don't come to Christ. And that should move us to some serious compassion and some serious intercession. It's the nature of intercession that is all about others. It's not about ourselves. Even when we pray for loved ones, when we intercede for loved ones, we've got to remove from it the selfish dimension that is God saved my son or saved my daughter so that I'm not miserable anymore. We need to say God save them so they don't go to hell. They are blaspheming your name with the lives that they live. And so compassion needs to be behind all of our prayers, not selfish ambition out of it. The very needs we have are the very needs that others have. And so when we understand the struggles we're having as believers, all we have to do is look around the church and realize many of those same people, if not every single one, are struggling with those same things or different versions of it. We are all frail people in need of a Savior and in need of each other, in need of each other's prayers. And so here comes the necessity of seeing the truth to be able to pray correctly. Let me give an expression of this. I've seen this many times, but I'm thinking of one particular one, and I won't mention where it's at, but I was ministering at this one church, and the pastor has a daughter that has backslid, totally backslid, and yet he still has her on the worship team because he doesn't want her not going to church anymore. So he has her on the worship team, but she's not walking with Jesus. And their idea is that, well, you know, she's a Christian. She's just not where she should be. And what that does is they begin to pray as if she is a believer, and they never pray correctly for her then. They're praying like she is just somebody that's having a little struggle in their Christian life, and she is in fornication. She is living a wicked life. And if they don't pray accordingly to the real spiritual condition of that woman, they're not going to be praying correctly for her. They need to be praying for her repentance and salvation, her turning from her sin. But because she walked with Jesus in her teen years, now that she's in her 20s, they just say, well, she's not backsliding. We don't believe in backsliding. So she just has a little problem in her life. Well, she does. She's at war with God. It's a terrible problem, and it will separate her forever in eternity. And the parents should come alive and understand the biblical truth about this so they pray correctly for their child. It's serious, so we need to know the truth about what we are praying for. Does God answer these kind of prayers? Is this in keeping with his will? Is this in keeping with the truth of who these people are and what their situation is? Sidlow Baxter said, Men may spurn our appeals reject our message, oppose our arguments, despise our persons, but they are helpless against our prayers. You see, prayer has infinite power behind it because the one we pray to is infinite in power. And this God can perform miracles when we pray according to his will and according to the true need of other people. And we need to understand that. Now, the next point that the Lord says, if my people will pray, But then he says, and seek my face. Now, what is the difference between praying and seeking the face of God? Well, in praying, we are dealing with the needs. We're dealing with the needs of our own life. We're dealing with the needs of other people. But seeking the face of God is not about needs. It's all about desire. It's all about a passion for God himself. It's not asking to get something from God or for God to do something for us. It is this hunger for God himself. 
This only comes through drawing near to God where we begin to know that he's the prize and this God that is worth selling everything to obtain and we're willing to seek him no matter what the cost is. Here is the eternal nature of seeking his face. You see, when we get to heaven, our intercession is done. Our praying for our own needs is done. I mean, everything we need then will be fully complete in Christ in heaven. We will be a finished work, in essence, up there. I believe there's still spiritual growth that will go on as we grow to know this God more and more. But there's no more sin. There's no more self-life. There's no more flesh to have to deal with. So anything of those kind of prayers are done away with. There's no need to intercede for the others in heaven because they themselves are in the presence of the wonder of this God. The only kind of prayer, if I might say it like that, that is eternal is the prayer that seeks the face of God. Because when we seek the face of God, we are doing now what we will be doing forever. We will be seeking after him, wanting him, longing him, enjoying him, seeing that his presence is the greatest treasure and gift and prize that we could be given. All the other expressions of prayer are swallowed up in heaven in a passion for Jesus, and they are swallowed up in the thought of seeking my face. Now, think of this. He is inviting us, seek my face. I'm wanting you to seek me. I'm wanting you to pursue me. Why? Because this God wants to do good to his people. He wants us to know the depths and heights and riches of his love so that we can walk in the power of that love and be able to portray it to others, speak of it to others, that they would know the wonder of who this God is. A passion for God produces a passion to pursue him. If we're not pursuing God, it's because we don't have a passion for him. And let me just say this very simply. People that don't have a passion for God don't have a passion to pursue him. And those who don't have a passion to pursue him don't have a passion for God. It's just the reality of so much of the church today. They go to church, they do their little Christian stuff, but they have no passion for him. They have no passion to pursue him. You don't see a prayer life or virtually no prayer life. They don't read much of the word, if ever. There's nothing burning in them. They have religious functions that they do, but they have no passion for God. And this can be as much in the ministry as it is among the lay people. This has to be something that we cry out to God for, that we would have a passion for him. And then as we begin to have a passion for him, we build on that passion by seeking God and making him the prize of all of our life, the prize of all prizes. In Psalms chapter 42, verses 1 and 2, the psalmist says, As a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go meet with God? You see nothing here of passive religion, but you see a passion after God. He brings out this passion in a way that can only be understood of those who would live in a desert. He says, as the deer pants for streams of water. So here you have this deer that's out in desert kind of lands or dry type of land, and they are thirsty, and they're sniffing for water, and they're trying to follow it. They're trying to find where it is. They are panting for it. They're thirsting for it. They're seeking after it. Their heart is yearning for it. The psalmist says, this is what I am. This is what my soul is. My soul is thirsting for God. This is the kind of passion that brings revival. This is the kind of passion after God that produces a passion for lost people to be saved. Robert Murray McSheehan went and said, Christ himself shall be the greatest reward of his people. Any place would be heaven if Christ were there. No place would be heaven without him. Oh, to talk with him as Moses and Elijah did on the Mount of Transfiguration, to hear him speak gracious words and lean our head where John leaned his, to hold him and not let him go, to have him turning upon us his eyes of divine tenderness and holy love, that will be a reward. You understand, the reward of seeking after the face of God is God himself. What comes next is what comes out of prayer and seeking the face of God. And it is the idea that we turn. Turn from what? Turn from our sin. Turn from our self-focus. Turn from our self-absorption, the depression it produces. To turn from everything that would take us away from God. To turn from everything that would feed our flesh life. Anything that would rob us of relationship with God. To turn from those things that are wicked and evil that are so obvious that we should have dealt with them long ago, but because our flesh loved them, we continued to pursue those things. I could go and take time and lay out a list of all the things we should turn from, but I think most of the church understands the reality of this. To turn 
is to turn away from sin, but we are not just turning away from sin. If we just try to turn away from sin without turning to Christ, we have not turned at all. We're just trading one sin for another sin then. But when we do this God's way, we are turning from sin because we have been turning to God, because we've been turning to him and wanting him. We have been seeking his face and desiring him. And because we are desiring him, we don't want anything in our life that would separate us, anything in our life that would grieve him. And so we turn, we turn from everything. We turn from the big things and the small things, the little things, the seemingly insignificant things, because we have one thing that begins to burn in us then, and that's a passion for Christ. And that passion for Christ means that we want clean hands and a pure heart so that nothing will keep us from ascending the hill of the Lord. Now, when we go through this whole process here of praying, seeking the face of God, humbling ourselves before him, when we go through all this, then we have a promise from God. He said, then I will. So God is waiting on us. He's not going to make us repent. He's not going to make us seek his face. He's not going to make us pray. He's not going to make us do any of those things. This is what we must do. And then when we do what he calls us to do, what he commands us to do, he has promised that he will respond. How will he respond? The first thing it says, he will hear. Now, of course, God hears every prayer in the sense that he is omnipresent and he's omniscient. So he's everywhere at once and he knows everything that there is to know. The idea of hearing here has to do with him looking upon our prayer with favor. And he receives our prayer with favor because we are then under the favor of God. So when people walk with Jesus in intimate fellowship because they are seeking the face of God, he says, I will hear. I will hear because they are in fellowship with me. They are desiring me. They are wanting me. And here comes where the power of revival can be seen, where people start wanting him so much, they are seeking the face of God, they've been turning from everything of the world that they might know him, and God says, I hear, I hear. And then he says, because I hear, I will now forgive. So God will forgive. If we will begin to seek the face of God, humble ourselves, turn from our wicked ways, then he will hear, and what will he hear? He will hear our desperate cries of repentance, our desperate cries of turning from our sin because we no longer want the sin and the compromise in our life because we have found Christ to be more than enough. He will forgive. This is such a sad thing that's going on in the church today. They are so often concentrating in churches on the aspect of personal inner healing all the positive cutesy little messages that are out there to help people's self-esteem and all the other psychological gibberish that is absolutely worthless, and worse than that, it is detrimental to the Christian life. The place of healing is the place of repentance, the place of turning, the place of seeking his face, of longing for him. You have depression in your life? Seek the face of Christ, and you'll find liberty and freedom in that. So as you're going through trials, seek the face of God, and you'll find victory. That's where healing is for the past and for the present, for the struggles we're going through, for the spiritual battles we're facing. It's in seeking the face of God and holding on to the promises that he says, I will hear, I will hear, and I will forgive your sins. And in the forgiving of your sins, I will bring healing to your sin-sick soul that is the very source of all your mental and emotional problems. Because the next thing he says is, I will heal. He will forgive and he will heal. That's what God does. If we are not having the healing of our emotions and our spiritual life, it's because we have done something wrong, that we've not been in that place of repentance. We've not been in that place of seeking after God. He's calling us to seek him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then he will forgive and he will heal. There is tremendous healing, tremendous healing at the foot of the cross. And when the church begins to go through this whole process, because this is powerful, imagine one person doing this. Imagine the power that is in that life that's being transformed. Now just imagine that this starts going beyond just that one person, and now you have multiple people. Now you have a whole church full that are humbling themselves, that are praying, that are seeking the face of God, that are turning from their sin. And then the promise God begins to hear, forgive and heal them. Imagine what starts coming out of that. That's where you begin to see revival explode because God begins to do something then when his church becomes beautiful to him, when his church is clothed with righteousness and the grace of God that transforms them into holy vessels. 
Then you have this divine magnetism of revival that starts drawing the lost in, starts drawing in people that are so hurt, so bruised and beaten up by the world that they begin to long for deliverance. And this divine magnetism draws them into the church and God does great and tremendous deliverances in those times because the power of the Holy Spirit is present to do a work. This is what we need. This is what the local church needs. And if a local church wants to get to the community at large, this is what the church needs to do to try and reach the community. Because there's no way that our own abilities and own wisdom can get to those communities. But there's a God who can break into every single home, break into the dreams of every single person, and he can do it without our even knowing it. This is what God does when people begin to fulfill the covenant promise of revival. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. Thirst no more, so come wash in the river, come drink your fill, let healing waters bear away your guilt, lay down your burdens on a beautiful shore, come wash in the river, come.